Hello, and thank you again for having me and for welcoming me, a total newbie in the world of Maynard Dixon, into this um, community. Um, so when I first started my job at Southern Utah Museum of Art almost exactly one year ago, I kept hearing about one of the collection's most treasured um, pieces, a Maynard Dixon painting. Now as noted in my biography, I came to this position with a lot of um, museum experience, but not with any expertise in Western art generally, let alone art of the American West. So um, I had no idea who this Dixon was, and so for a while I filed him away in the art history part of my brain as Dorothea Lange's husband because that's, uh, of course I knew who she was. So the occasion of this exhibition here at BYU and of this symposium gave me good reason to research just how this prized painting along with two other Dixons came into the collection of Southern Utah Museum of Art which is the campus and community arts institution that now cares for and exhibits the art collection of Southern Utah University um, and her predecessors. As you will see, SUU is only the most recent name for this 125-year-old institution, which is located in rural Southern Utah, just north of Zion National Park. So I called this a mystery uh, because this project was the best kind of art historical detective provenance investigation full of rumors, hearsay, and dubious paperwork. So I will present to you this morning exactly what I discovered and take you down the rabbit hole with me. Okay. So, as I mentioned, Suma possesses three Maynard Dixon artworks. This is the painting, our most prized possession, perhaps. Um, this is Poplars and Sunlight, dated 1935, and you'll notice, and this is relevant, that it also has a 1935 accession number. So this was painted in Carson City, probably when Dixon was staying with the Bradleys in the early fall after he filed and finalized his divorce from Dorothea Lange. It appears to me almost to be like a partner piece to the painting upstairs entitled Empty House on display, yeah, in the exhibition with these towering poplars as the muse. Um, this incidentally will also be exhibited uh, next year at the Nevada Museum of Art Show and published in their catalog, but to my knowledge this has not been published before. Um, then we have this beautiful chalk drawing entitled Mexican Woman, dated 1939, again with this 1939 accession number, um, which was perhaps made in Tucson while traveling and or settling in Arizona with Edith ha Hamlin. Unfortunately, there isn't any notation of location on the drawing, and this has also, to my knowledge, never been published. And finally, we have Study of Indians After Horse, dated 1942, but this we have some solid provenance on, which is why it's not really going to be, I won't really talk about it in this presentation. Um, it was donated to us in 1974. Um, maybe it's a study related to the Palomino Ponies um, postal um, office uh, mural um, of the same year. It's also reproduced and mis mistitled and perhaps even it, um, in uh, Burnside's Maynard Dixon, Artists of the West, but this predates its 1973 publication, predates Suma's accession and seemingly the acquisition by the donor who gave it to us because it's credited in that publication to a different collector altogether. But we're gonna put that one to the side because it's not quite as interesting. So our internal records indicate that the painting, Poplars in Sunlight and Mexican Woman, um, were in fact purchased using state appropriations, which makes sense. We are a state university after all. In 1935 and 1939, and for a whopping $1,400 for the painting and $685 for the drawing. No original paperwork from the 1930s and 40s exists. But later, um, rather later documents from the Braithwaite Fine Arts Gallery, Suma's Campus Museum predecessor, which opened in 1974. However, it seems that the paperwork we have likely originated in the 1980s. So several things immediately struck me as odd, kind of triggering my art historian um, spidey sense. First of all, that the accession numbers for Poplars and Mexican Women match the years inscribed by Dixon on his works, which maybe suggested that they were purchased directly from him. 
this was not crazy because he was living, you know, at Mount Carmel with Edith Hamlin, not far from Cedar City. However, he was mostly in his sort of post-divorce peregrination around Nevada and in San Francisco in 1935 and 36. A show in Utah of his paintings in 37 might have included poplars, um, but that wasn't until yet 1937. And of course, Ian Hamlin didn't even move to Mount Carmel until 1940. So the timeline just didn't really make sense. Plus, these recorded sale prices of $1,400 and 685 seemed a little crazy for a small agricultural college, because at this point, SUU was Branch Agricultural College, which was a branch of Utah State Agricultural College, now Utah State University. Um, but this is in the midst of the Depression, and we know especially that BYU purchased their 85 paintings and drawings for a sum of $3,700. So $1,400 for one piece seems a little outlandish. So how and when did these two Maynard Dixon works end up in the collection of a small agricultural college in rural southern Utah? And above all, what can these two works tell us about how Maynard Dixon and Edith Hamlin contributed to and participated in the local art scene in their adopted home of southern Utah? But most, maybe more importantly, how do these pieces reflect and their, their um, acquisition reflect how, the way this small farm town understood art as central to the enrichment of their community. So, in 1940, a visionary junior high arts or junior high school art teacher, Eugene Jorgensen, proposed the idea to initiate an annual community art exhibition featuring the work of selected local, regional, and national artists. The Cedar City Art Committee was born to coordinate this exhibition. By 1966, the exhibition was recognized as one of the most important shows of its kind in the West. And when the last exhibition took place in 2008, it was celebrated as one of the most during community art efforts in the country. In his letter, this is a draft that's in, uh, SUU has the, uh, our special collections has the Cedar City Art Committee archive. We are lucky to have that. So in his letter addressed to fellow artists soliciting participation in the first Cedar City exhibition in May 1940, um, hoping to make this exhibit one of the best in the state, Eugene Jorgensen, whose title reads at the bottom, you can see, Art Director, Cedar City Schools, he writes, quote, our need for art stimulus and invigoration has been felt for some time. Now the time is ripe. Um, this, of course, makes total sense. After suffering for more than a decade through the Depression, this community was ready for something light and exciting. Um, however, there seems to be more behind this artistic endeavor. Um, this document is found in the 1940 folder of the Cedar City Art Committee archive, and it seems to indicate the inspiration or motiv motivation behind this project. As you can see at the top, um, it's an outline for a small community gallery as conceived by the Utah Art Project WPA. This proposal describes, I'm just gonna read from this a little bit, uh, describes a place that from its inception should be a truly civic affair, a place wherein all things of cultural nature should be concentrated, paintings hung on the wall should play but a small part in the life of the gallery. Other things such as lectures, plays, musicals, gallery dis discussions, etc., should have a prominent part. As many groups as possible should be asked to contribute morally to his activities. And then on the bottom we have this um, list of reasons for such a gallery and to highlight a couple, the first one, to present to the people in the small community works of art heretofore only seen in metropolitan areas, to have available such a place for community discussions regarding cultural subjects, to provide a meeting place wherein all civic and cultural groups may congregate, and to provide adequate material for students of various arts. We know that this and other uh, community galleries had art classes for adults and children. So to me, this sounds like an utter utopia. Um, and it really resonates with our mission at SUMA as the arts institution in rural southern Utah. So I feel like I have written this list, could have written this list. It feels really, uh, I feel kindred spirit with this, uh, this project. So I was curious, though, about um, the title of this little manifesto, connecting it to the Utah WPA. And it turns out that the Cedar City Arts Committee, Art Committee, and its annual art exhibit were part of the WPA Federal Art Project Community Arts Center program. So in 1935, Daniel S. Deffenbacher, pictured here in the center, 
Um, I love pictures that show people just casually smoking cigarettes and pipes in the office. <laughs> um, he was a young architect and industrial designer who left his architecture firm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina to become the state director of the WPA's fe federal art project for North Carolina. He ended up launching the Community Art Center program there in order to open the art world to every American citizen. Deffenbacher saw the Community Art Center as a gathering place for learning, culture, and amusement, a destination, a town square, with a mission to support all the arts. As he said, this is a quote, art springs from the human need and its values must be based upon human values. The museum, therefore, must measure its vitality in terms of service to the human need in its community. It must integrate art with the experience of living. His successful experiment in North Carolina was not a one-off, as the Community Arts Center program quickly became a national movement. Between 1935 and 39, Deffenbacher established more than 70 art centers across the country. This photograph shows him at work at Minneapolis's Walker Art Center, his last and largest project, but Utah was actually the recipient of funding for five centers. Uh, the Utah Art Center, once located at 59 South State Street in the heart of Salt Lake City, and um, so-called extension galleries in Helper, Price, and Provo, and the Cedar City Art Exhibition Association, which we now know as the Art Committee. Whereas the Utah Art Center eventually quickly, um, unfortunately, became the War Services Center in 1942 and then closed when um, WPA funding dried up. Clearly, the city's Cedar City program did not merely survive, largely through local donations, but it thrived for 68 years. But it is therefore also no surprise that we find the ideology started by Deffenbacher, the ideology behind this program and the community galleries it spawned echoed in the self-proclaimed mission and self-produced programming of the city's Cedar City Art Committee. Although they were not able to establish a permanent space, their annual art exhibit event nonetheless did seek to achieve a lot of the program's goals and did. The annual art exhibit both laid the foundation for a deep appreciation of the arts within Cedar City that persists today, and also established the arts as central to the civic life of that community. A program of events from the 1941 exhibit demonstrates how this event was more than just about like, paintings hanging on the walls. Uh, the afternoon program on May 11, 1941, featured a male quartet and ladies double trio, the Br Branch Agricultural College Dance Group, and a lecture by LeConte Stewart introduced in the press release as head of the University of Utah Art Department the week before Mrs. Flora D. Fisher of the BYU art faculty also gave a lecture. So the exhibit was typically set up in the local high school gymnasium and was open to the public with free admission. In this, their apparent press release from 1941, the committee really encapsulates their mission simply and beautifully. The art patrons of Cedar City have gone to considerable expense to bring the exhibit and show it free to the public because they believe art is for all. Um, at least one artwork was selected each year to be purchased for the city, and as the event evolved, students would save money and seek to buy art for their schools. There are stories, oral story, oral history kind of legends of students. Um, they would have like coffee cans set up, and kids would drop their pennies and quarters and whatnot in the cans that they wanted to, um, in front of the art that they wanted to have purchased. So on the list of the artworks sold in the 1946 exhibit, this is quite evident. Cedar City Elementary, Cedar High, Cedar Junior High, Paragona School, in addition, of course, to Branch Agricultural College, now SUU, are all listed as purchasers. By 1946, according to the Iron County record, many, this is quote, many beautiful paintings may now be found in the schools, churches, and libraries of Cedar City, as well as in many homes of the community as a result of the annual art exhibit. About 20 purchases were made at the exhibit last April. So with many more, ta more time restrictions lifted in 1946, the public was assured that this would be the best exhibit yet. So here we have a couple articles about this 1946, which is relevant to our Maynard Dixon, because as you see, we it details the hearty response for people who are invited, um, artists who are invited um, from artists all over the nation. So among the artists expressing intentions of sending canvases this year, we see first and foremost Maynard Dixon. And then I love it says at the end, uh, the committee urges citizens to set aside funds for painting, uh, for a painting to beautify their own homes and specifically call attention, 
to officers of church auxiliary schools, hotels, lodges, public institutions to make plans at a painting as part of this year's beautification campaign. And then we have this uh, April 18th article that mentions more than 200 paintings and specific that were contributed by the artists and specifically mentioned are Poplars in Sunlight and Land Westward by Maynard Dixon. And then we have the two brochures uh, for the 1946. Just note the E. Van Eck, that will come up again. And then inside, again, we see confirmed uh, Poplars in Sunlight and Land Westward for sale for a whopping $500. And then here's the list where you can also see all the schools that purchased um, pieces, as well as private individuals. And here you have that BAC, Branch Agricultural College, in fact, bought the poplars for only $300. So they got some kind of discount. Um, so um, there we have it, part one of the mystery solved um, with the receipts, which is always great. So it also seems rather poetic that given the consistent WPA patronage of Dixon and Hamlin, that our Poplar's painting would have been purchased through an exhibition rooted in the principles and funding of the Federal Art Project. Um, incidentally, Land Westward, a far more famous piece, um, did not sell in this show, but seems to have eventually made its way back to San Francisco to Gump's, um, where it was ultimately purchased by private collectors, and it was recently sold in 2021 for more than $350,000. So some people in Cedar um, really missed out on this one. <laughs> Um, following the closing program of the 1946 exhibit, which included a dance performance and discussion of art, we have a 20, April 25th newspaper article that says, with the consent of purchasers, paintings bought during the show will be exhibited at the local art gallery in the Southern Utah Power Company building beginning May 1st. It struck me as an unusual venue, here we see, uh, archival photo. Um, yeah, Southern Utah Power Company struck me as kind of a strange venue for an exhibition, but apparently this company located on North Main Street in Cedar City, here you have it today, not as beautiful a facade or I'm missing the neon sign, but you can note the, the sort of weird yin yang kind of um, forms on top. Now it's a barber shop. Um, but they, um, it seems that it was not only a space for showcasing art purchased through the annual art exhibit and kind of celebrating the success, but that it also hosted its own exhibitions, including one, guess what, featuring Maynard Dixon in 1947. Um, the only record I could find of the show is this newspaper article. Um, and it details um, paintings by the late Maynard Dixon are now on exhibit at the Southern Utah Power Company showrooms. Maynard Dixon, perhaps one of the West's greatest painters, passed away last November 13th. Um, and then it goes on to kind of laud him. It features uh, one of his poems. And then he, it says at the bottom of the first column, um, he was a consistent exhibitor at Cedar City Art Exhibits. I'm not sure how consistent, I haven't found evidence of that, but one of his fine paintings, of course it says again, Poplars was purchased last year by BAC and notes that BYU has the largest collection of Maynard Dixon paintings in the West being valued at many thousands of dollars. Um, and it says that this, in the sort of second little block, says that this exhibition comprised of mostly drawings, pencil, pen and ink, and charcoal and notes several that maybe are familiar to, to, I, for, to you all, haven't been able to find much with these. Wearing the blanket, described as a drawing of an Indian woman, um, dressed in a blanket, um, as well as uh, these other sort of um, landscape ones. And then it says, they're very reasonably priced and this might be your last opportunity. So hopefully somebody got them. Because it says in a later article from February of that year announcing um, Evanek's subsequent show that five paintings were bought by individuals and schools in Cedar City from this show at the Power Company. I don't know, have the record of this sale, um, but it's clear that this sent more Dixons kind of out into the Cedar, uh, disseminated more out into the Cedar City community. I don't know to whom or to where, but interesting to speculate about it. Because um, the following year on Sunday morning, December 12th, 1948, a, we're a little out of order, sorry, a, um, 
uh, December 12th, a fire destroyed much of Old Main, which was the building that served as a library and several department offices on the campus of Branch Agricultural College. It tore through the upper stories and people tried to salvage as much as they could, but much was lost. So here you can see people, little kids actually kind of trying to bring stuff out and then the kind of cleanup effort afterwards. Um, you can see, sorry, I must have put that out of order. In the, uh, in the article, um, coming out a couple days later on the 16th, it notes that the art department lost a lot of stuff. They were on these upper floors, including original paintings, including two paintings by Maynard Dixon and one by E. Van Eck. In a number of etchings, lithographs, and woodcuts were on display at the Escalante Hotel. I managed to escape destruction, but a lot of stuff amassed by uh, Mary Basto, who was the head of, interestingly, uh, the first head of the art department and a woman, um, lost a lot of the um, materials that she had collected. So, all right. So now in this account of the fire, it says that two Mason, Mason, Maynard Dixons were lost and one Van Act. And in fact, this is the own inventory um, notes that um, Susan Bingham very generously sent me from the uh, Thunderbird Foundation's copy of Maynard Dixon's inventory. And you can see it says College of Southern Utah. You can kind of get kind of close up that it notes that College of Southern Utah, which was the name after Branch Agricultural College, um, CSU, starting in 1951, um, that it was purchased you can kind of see 1946, Cedar City, and then here, destroyed by fire, 1948. So, of course, we know that this painting, because we have it, um, survived. Um, and, but what, what were there two that were lost? As I will discuss in a minute, the Mexican woman could not have been one of the two because it turns out we didn't acquire that until 1956. Um, but was there another one that we acquired maybe through this power company show that was actually lost in the fire? So that there, there were two and that they were destroyed by fire it could be a matter of incomplete and thus incorrect information that was published before all the items that were saved from the fire could be accounted for. But that E. Van Eck uh, painting on the, the brochure cover um, acquired in the 1946 exhibit in, um, actually seems to be a victim of the fire because we have the, all the other ones that we purchased um, before 1948 are accounted for in our collection. So it's unclear to me um, what, what is going on here with the fire. Um, so I feel like one mystery was solved and another mystery was born and I can't stop speculating or thinking about what other Dixon might have been lost and whether it was something that was one of these five things purchased in that power company. Um, show. But then also that article notes that there were these objects or these artworks that were saved because it was in this exhibition um, at the S El Escalante ballroom across from the um, sort of train station at the time in Cedar City. And here we have a drawing which is not identified as being by Maynard Dixon, but is clearly a Maynard Dixon um, drawing. Um, maybe looks akin to these sort of studies for Earth Knower. Um, Although I had never seen the one um, that's on all the posters around the museum. I guess that's Silent Hour, which looks a lot like this one. But it, his pieces are, this would have been a drawing. He's not named as a contributor to the exhibition. And this was mostly for prints, both photographic and otherwise. So I'm not sure what this piece has to do with anything if it was sold. But we see that same image again for yet another Maynard Dixon exhibition, this one from 1956. This again was um, um, sent to me by Susan Bingham. We don't have this in SUU um, uh, special collection, so it's a real, um, real, really amazing um, and generous thing that I'm glad that the Thunderbird Foundation has. So you can see um, the works, the paintings from $185 and $25 for drawings. Here are some of the pieces that were featured. And this one is not at the Power Company or the Art Committee. This is specifically at the College of Southern Utah. So note some of the names might be familiar to you, especially some of the um, paintings. 
so the only thing that we have at SUU is this, it was really hard to photograph because it's these bound um, newspapers. Um, and this one notes, right, there's our Mexican woman as the featured piece. And it notes um, um, that a, it's a chance of a lifetime opportunity in art circles has been made possible at CSU on Sunday, January 15th, again, 1956. Maynard Dixon's collections of paintings, drawings, and sketches will go on exhibition under the direction of Gael Lindstrom, chairman of the art department at CSU. Mr. Lindstrom announced that Edith Dale Hamlin, ha Hamblin, they, mis they misspell her name a lot, wife of the deceased artist, has agreed to send the collection from her home, San Francisco, to enter it in the Southern Utah show. So despite the fact that Edith Hamlin had remarried and returned to San Francisco in 1953, she remained connected to Cedar City. In fact, she contributed um, paintings to the Cedar City art exhibit in 1955, 1956, 1957 and 1958. And as a result, we forgive me, we have we are in the process of rephotographing a lot of our works. These have not been rephotographed, so these are bad iPhone photographs of the paintings on the, our art racks. But this gives you a sense of the of the works that we have in our collection, one of which was actually donated back to our donated to us by Iron County School um, System, um, which they had um, purchased at one of the art exhibits. So this, um, so it is from this 1956 show at um, College of Southern Utah that the that we purchased Mexican Woman featured in the article and of course at the top of the list of the drawings. Um, but it's pretty remarkable in my mind that some of what we might now consider Maynard Dixon's most iconic paintings were for sale in this community and for a steal, <laughs> including. Right, we uh, two a couple pieces that were um, featured in in um, presentations um, yesterday. Um, Little sister from the Blackfoot, um, Blackfoot, Blackfeet, um, Montana. Um, Men in Mountains, which was featured in last night's exhibition or last night's talk, um, and. Fields of Tokerville, which is my personal favorite because this is my view. I live in Hurricane, so on my commute home from Cedar City, I see this as I drive off the highway and through Tokerville toward Hurricane. And Destination Unknown, which I believe, and you all are the authority, but I believe Destination Unknown was an alternative or maybe an, an original title for Destination Nowhere, one of these iconic um, Depression era um, paintings. So not to mention these beautiful illustrations and apparently gasp three nudes. So we have solved two mysteries, the origins, the provenance of poplars and sunlight and Mexican woman. One gained what were, if any, these two um, pieces lost to the fire. But in the end, the stories of poplars and Sunlight and Mexican Women reveal a lesser known exhibition history of Maynard Dixon, largely facilitated by Edith Hamlin, and it generates all kind of kind of fun speculation about who saw and who bought Dixon works in Cedar City. But most importantly, when we examine Dixon and Hamlin's connection to the landscape and people of Mount Carmel, Zion, and the surrounding areas, it is primarily through the art they created. But their participation in the Cedar City Arts Exhibit um, and other shows at the university and in the community, on the other hand, demonstrate that they were involved, maybe even integrally, to the project of making their art, art in general, more accessible to the people of Southern Utah and beyond. In addition, they contributed really to the deep-rooted pride the citizens of Cedar City have to this day about the fundamental importance of the arts in their community. Thank you.